afternoon, Kathleen. Hello, thank you very, very much. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, I can. That's awesome. Everybody, I'm very grateful to be with you this afternoon. Thanks so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Chris and I am indeed from Tech Coaches. My purpose is to help people understand technology. As an organization, we are solely focused on boosting digital literacy for anybody with a willingness to learn. Uh, so I'm very happy to meet you here today as you are that type of person, that person with a willingness to learn. Uh, who am I? What do I know? Where am I from? And why am I here? I come from a background of being a technology educator for seniors for over a decade. I started Canada's first nonprofit charity that taught seniors how to use technology free of charge with a volunteer organized program. That organization was called Elder Technology Assistance Group. It was funded by the Ontario Trillium Foundation as well, uh, just like Toronto Council on Aging. And we were funded by them at the beginning of our existence for the first five years. And then after about a decade of working solely with seniors and volunteers, I started Tech Coaches because I wanted to help many, many more people. I wanted to help organizations. I wanted to help individual people that weren't seniors. They were 40, 45 years old and needed to grasp technology and the literacy around it so that they could exist confidently and comfortably in our modern society. So Tech Coaches was born to do just that. It's my vehicle where I'm able to boost digital literacy with the help of my, uh, my very great small team. Uh, and what we do in the modern COVID world is virtual. Most things have turned virtual and your ability to plug into those things has a lot to do with your digital literacy. And it's been a very interesting perspective from my position as we've undergone this necessity to be able to use technology so that we can socialize and communicate at a normal level uh, because I've been talking about that for a decade. And now everybody realizes it almost as though it's as obvious as I see it. So I'm here today to talk a little bit about demystifying technology. I wanna make terminology make sense. I wanna communicate well so that everybody can understand the technology that I think you should A, be able to identify and B, stuff that's gonna maybe create value for you, maybe. So we're gonna talk about that. Everything I give you today is based on my opinion, I must say. My opinion, like your opinion, is based on my experiences. Uh, I have over 10,000 hours experience helping different individual seniors, and we're talking about thousands of different people over the last decade. Uh, so that's what I bring to the table for you today. And again, I'm very appreciative that you're here. I really appreciate your willingness to learn. I think that that's something lots of people don't have a, a high enough willingness for a willingness to learn but there's also the willingness to accept change that is involved with your learning process and if you're learning something and you don't change what you're doing to reflect what you've learned then what exactly did you learn did you learn anything at all i think that learning and change go hand in hand just like technology and change so I hope that we can explore that a little bit today. Uh, demystifying technology, terminology, gadgets, and building your digital literacy. This is where we're gonna shoot today. I hope that you can hang on tight because I really wanted to say a lot and I'm gonna drop a ton of information in a short period of time. So I'm also happy that there's a recording that we can share, not only with people that aren't here today, but also so that folks can just give it another listen if you wanted to, because I just keep yammering on about something at a pretty quick rate. And I, and I appreciate that you, that you think it is quick. I normally wouldn't do it, but I'd normally take much more time than maybe 45 minutes. So bear with me as I blast through some stuff. Before I dive in too deep, I wanted to put some stuff for your consideration on the table that I personally and tech coaches, we, we embody it as foundational points about technology today. So for your review, the road towards our future is rich with more technology. We went from Windows XP to Windows 
you know, seven, eight, eight point one, ten, and and do you think we're done? No way. And do you think that we're done with smartphones now that we've found that technology? Or do you think we're going to continue to invent new devices like watches and glasses and rings and things that go in your ear? And if you're into Elon Musk at all, he's into Neuralink, which is a chip that's inserted into your head. And maybe, just maybe, it fixes dementia. Like, could you imagine if, if they put a computer chip in people's brains and it could fix dementia? And, th and this is what we talk about now in the world of technology. It doesn't mean that's real right now. What it means is somebody's putting a lot of effort, a lot of thought, maybe even a lot of money into trying to push some of this stuff forward. And my argument for you is there's only more technology in the future because that's all that I've ever seen. As a professional, I've only seen more and more new technology to come out over time. So I suggest that just continues to go as we move forward. And as a result of that, I already mentioned this, it's going to change. I ask you to remember a cell phone that you had in the year 2000. How relevant is that cell phone to you today? I would probably suggest it's not relevant to you at all. That phone from the year 2000, maybe it flipped open. I had one and it glowed this blue color. It was made by Nokia. I called it the blue brick. And that phone is so irrelevant right now, 20 years later, completely irrelevant. What do you think is going to happen to the technology of today, 20 years down the road? It, it may be even seemingly more irrelevant because of how quickly technology moves. So it's definitely not going to stay in one place and it's going to change. So please don't get connected to the way that something's done right now because you're just sort of waiting for it to change into its next, its next state, uh, the next chapter of that particular technology, if you will. So I can guarantee change when it comes to technology, and I can also guarantee failure. I know that technology is gonna fail. I just know it. That's why, as a professional, I bring around a couple of computers with me when I'm going to do an in-person presentation because a couple of times in my career, one computer didn't work out and I needed the other one. Or I can't rely on my USB stick because for whatever reason, the file didn't, didn't open from that and now I'm having to pull it off of Dropbox or Google Drive or I'm getting a copy of it from my email and all of this because technology just didn't work right something didn't happen right and it's not even necessarily anything that we did it just has failure built right into it because we are not perfect as humans and that means that anything that we create is also not perfect and as a result of that you should really expect that from time to time technology is going to fail and that means we should have a little bit of digital literacy around how to troubleshoot at a very basic level Sometimes what I'm talking about in that regards is just the knowledge of maybe you could shut it off and turn it back on and everything would be working just fine. Or maybe you had to go to the extent of uninstalling an app from your iPad and reinstalling it again from the app store and that fixes the problem. And you really should be able to go through two or three different troubleshooting techniques because technology is going to fail and it needs you to be able to do that so that you can push forward with it. I also recognize that the devices of today don't last like they used to. I have a 1970s Fender guitar amplifier and it sounds pristine. And there will not be iPads handed down 30 years from now, 40 50 years from now, no, no way. They build the stuff so that it expires. It's like food. It only has a shelf life of X amount of time, and then they don't really expect it to A, work right, or B, be relevant. They make the new one do so many different things, and they make it capable of so many different, more let's say process heavy things. So the device needs to be more capable that the older ones just can't keep up and they continue to push this forward. 
because it sort of feeds the machine. It, it makes it so that we all need a new device from time to time. Gone are the days where you spend, you know, $500 and keep something for 10 years, 12 years. That's not how they make them now. Now they make the iPad and it's at that $500 price point and at about five years, you're gonna wanna get a new iPad because of A, your iPad doesn't do what you want it to do because the new apps require the new features that yours doesn't have, or two, you've got something not working right. Maybe the home button stops working, maybe the battery's not lasting, maybe the Wi-Fi isn't working in the backyard anymore, but when you first got it, it was working perfectly in the backyard. That's just what happens to it. It's planned obsolescence. It's on its way out, you know, all the time it's alive. It's on its way out, just like I am. Know that that's the case. Don't have unrealistic expectations for cheap technology because a $100 tablet, maybe it's going to last one year, you know, two years, maybe, and you're not going to like it. It's not going to be a great experience. It's a cheap tablet, so it's going to be a cheap experience. So keep that in your back pocket. It's not my favorite, but I know that my devices are all obsolete in a shorter period of time than I would prefer. We need to employ good digital habits. They're bad when you can't break them. You know, that's how you know it's a bad habit when really like you can't even break it. You keep recycling the same password or you keep using almost something that I'd call easy as your password just because it's more comfortable for you. But that's not a good habit. That's a, that's a bad one to get into because now you're just used to doing that and you've done it for so many things that you'd have to do too much work to do anything about it when in the first place you should have been using a unique password for everything and you should have been making sure that that password was strong because we're doing our online banking, we're buying things on Amazon, we're ordering digital content from maybe it's Netflix, maybe it's the new, uh, the new Disney Plus because everybody's going digital, right? So now we have more and more passwords than we've ever had before and you can't be lazy with it. You can't get bad habits and recycle them. Please have unique, strong passwords. What would a strong password be? It would be capital letters, lowercase letters, numbers, throw in a dollar sign or an exclamation mark. I, I avoid using words in my strong passwords. I'm not even using a word. It's just letters and numbers in a combination and I write it all down in a secret book and I keep it hidden at home for when I need it and I don't keep it in my pocket. I don't put it in my purse. I don't have it in my fanny pack. I literally only bring it out at home when I need it because I can't remember that Facebook password, that Instagram password, that Amazon Prime password. I like to write them down. If you're like me, maybe you want to do the same. Go to the Dollarama, grab yourself a little notebook, and then put everything in the same book so that you're not wondering where did I write that down and keep it hidden at home under the floorboard kind of thing. And now all you got to do is remember where you hid that little book full of secret passwords. Don't put it in a file on your computer that, uh, that's called passwords and you're just continuously writing all of that down in there and then somebody gets into your computer or somebody gets onto your Google Drive or whatever and they find your password file, that would not be something that you wanna do either, so pay attention to that. Now more than ever, there is so much information available on the internet that you have to have your guard up because we can't believe it just because we saw it on the internet. That doesn't mean that it's true because your opinion is on the internet and then the opposite of your opinion is also on the internet, abundantly available, and neither one are necessarily true, right? Like it doesn't mean you're right just because you have an opinion. It doesn't mean that that opinion is right. What I'm saying is, is every opinion is available on all the topics, so whatever it is you wanted to find, you could find it. So don't put yourself down a rabbit hole looking at a rash on your foot 
and now you think you've got flesh eating disease because you saw it on the internet, it's very likely not the case. So you have to just keep your guard up, pay attention to what you're reading, pay attention to where it came from, what organization, what individual said it. That's going to be important. And my friends, this gets more significant as we go forward because technology is kicking into high gear. And what you see, it becomes more difficult to determine if it's true or not. I'm going to talk a little bit about it as we go this afternoon through this information. As I said, I've got lots to share with you, so let's push on. I like to advocate for mastering the basics. All that I'll leave you with here is a baby comes out and has to crawl before it walks. And after it walks, it doesn't take long before it can start to run. So don't think you're going to skip crawling. Master the basics. When you buy a new Samsung Galaxy tablet, understand how to push all the buttons properly. Some of those buttons you can push three and four different ways, but it's the same one button. And just mastering how to touch those three, four different buttons that you've got properly then leads you to swiping the screen and opening the apps and doing the right things in that very basic way, getting a good foundation, comfort, confidence comes from that foundation. And now walking can turn into running very, very quickly. It's the snowball effect. I think you know what I'm talking about. So take it easy when it comes to learning anything. Think about technology like an instrument. If it were a flute and it's day one, expect what you'd expect on day one of the flute. You're not going to be super great on the end of the first day, but keep at it every day for a week or two. And it's drastically different over that short period of time. So please be realistic with yourself as well. Uh, let's do that uh, together. Amy, I'm reading your comment. Thanks. You threw me off because now I'm thinking about running 100 kilometers. I appreciate that. I'll talk to you later. Uh, anybody with a willingness to learn can use technology. Anybody with a willingness to learn. That's the thing that separates those that do and those that don't. It's the willingness to learn. If you're not willing, then I can't teach you because you didn't want to. So you're not even really listening to me when I'm trying to teach. A three-year-old, when they want the thing on the screen because they find value in it, they're willing to learn how to do it. So they're watching and they see mom pull out the iPad and she opens up the Netflix app and she opens the kid's profile and she slides her finger over and she touches on the cover that she wants the kid to watch and then she adjusts the volume and the kid's been watching intently the whole time because he's super willing to learn. And that's all that it took. A couple of times, monkey see, monkey do. He observes that and then he goes off and now he's using an iPad and he's three years old. And you're thinking there's something brilliant about these kids. And there's nothing brilliant about these kids. What's brilliant is how simple technology is today. That's what's brilliant. It's so brilliant that three-year-old children can use very complicated devices that are simple to use as a fundamental skill in their development. I'm just putting that on the table for your consideration as well. Why is an iPad designed so that a three-year-old can do it? It's so that the three-year-old picks up using an iPad like he picked up talking and like he picked up walking. Walking, talking, using iPads. They all happen at the same time, and that's normal. Please don't throw your opinion around about that's too much technology. Let's not give them screens. You're at a disadvantage if you don't have digital literacy now, and, and it's designed so that we can pick it up early because it's the extension of what we do as humans. We plug into devices and connect over the internet all around the world, all hours of the day, and, and that's what today's all about. We're in the information age and children, as they grow up, they need that skill. They're going to be at a disadvantage if they don't have digital literacy. It's as significant as your normal literacy, however you want to refer to that. I should find out the real way to refer to that. If anybody knows, write that in the chat. But standard protocol literacy that you get at school, it's like that with digital literacy now. That's why programming, coding, 
is included in your curriculum and handwriting is not because nobody cares about handwriting, but everybody has to have some optics on how to code. And unfortunately for all of us on this call, we don't know how to code. I'm, I'm quite certain that most of us on this call don't know how to code. So now children in high school know a topic that we don't even know how to talk about and it's their normal school subject. So just please keep that in, in your radar screen. Uh, it's important that, that young people use technology confidently. Not all technology. Everybody shouldn't use all technology because not all technology is for everybody. There is technology for everybody though. There's so many amazing things that you can do with it. So there's definitely something out there for you. What you're looking for is what has value. What do I like to do? If, if you don't get value out of Facebook, don't use Facebook. If you don't get value out of TikTok, don't use TikTok. But if you do get value out of Twitter, then definitely use Twitter because you're getting value out of it. Today, I'm not gonna talk too much about social media, but I do wanna touch on that for our, uh, for our interest sake today. Let's get started with the meat and potatoes of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, here's a, a lead in statement. Isn't it weird to think about launching rockets into space like a normal run of the mill thing that we do across the planet like regularly? Like it's not impressive. We're, we're hardly even paying attention to that kind of thing anymore because it happens so normally. And what else is normal about it that boggles my mind? A computer brings the rocket down and lands it on the earth within centimeters of where it was asked to do so. No pilot involved. That's amazing. And yet it, nobody even cares, you know, because we are in a time when technology is so lackluster to us because it does so many incredible things that we're almost not amazed anymore. There's so much amazing that we're not even amazed by it anymore. But I'm continuously amazed by it. I want to help people be amazed by it. And I want to help you feel comfortable using it. So let's push on with something more than SpaceX and this Falcon Heavy that I've got up here. Again, Elon Musk, I'm listening to what that guy's talking about because he does some interesting technology related things. So keep your finger on what that guy's doing too. If you can read an article, that guy's normally pushing the envelope on, on what he's doing. So talking about what normal is, has really changed in the last, let's call it five years, when it comes to augmented reality and virtual reality and the normalization of those things. I wanted to make sure that everybody, because we're demystifying technology, I want you to know what this is all about because what we're gonna see as we creep into the near future is a whole bunch of devices that are offering us experiences in augmented reality and virtual reality. And the virtual reality stuff you're putting on your head, okay? So that's like when you stick your phone into one of those little goggle sets and you put it on your head and it puts you into a different environment. So I just wanna make sure that everybody sees the difference between the two things, okay? So augmented reality, I like to think of it as a blend of deception and reality. So it's the generation of a new environment to supplement or enhance your existing environment. So you can see in this picture, the guys or the lady, sorry, or maybe, I don't know, they're looking at a, a pool table and now there's, an, um, there's a, a rainbow that's shown up but it's only on the screen of the phone. It's clearly not gonna be on the pool table, it's only on the screen of the phone but the phone has intelligence in it that's able to put that rainbow on the table in such a perspective that it makes it look like on the phone screen that it's actually standing there on the table. So here's another example of where you might be able to use this. Imagine somebody that works for the city and they're checking all of the pipes underneath the streets. So they walk around with an iPad or a smartphone and they're looking through the screen that's using the camera to look at the road. And on the screen, what they're seeing is where the pipe would be laying underneath the road. 
because the app that they could be using has the map of where all of the pipes are for that community programmed into it. So now when they look at it using this augmented reality, they can see exactly under the sidewalk where all of those pipes are. And they don't have to dig up the whole sidewalk to figure that kind of thing out. It's really going to change the way that we do lots of things. Think about a game. Think about when a child's playing a game and the zombie walks in their bedroom door because the game just makes it look like the zombies in the room with them because of the augmented reality. It's a blend of deception and reality. So as they look at the screen, one thing's real. And when they look away from the screen, another thing seems real. It's quite a remarkable technology and, and it's just getting started and it's starting to roll out on all the phones. Yes. Pokemon Go, that's exactly right, Kathleen. That's exactly right. Now we've got as well, oh, I apologize. I unfull screened that for whatever reason there. Um, the next thing that I've got, oh, sorry, I clicked a YouTube link and it's gonna show you the video, but I'm not gonna do that now, I apologize. So the next thing is virtual reality. And virtual reality is, quite a bit different. It's like a computer generated simulation. So it's one of those, put it on your head, put some headphones in, and now you, you almost are sensing like you're in a different environment. Uh, it, it's a remarkable experience. I did this at a health center in late 2019 with the Toronto Public Library there, bringing some of their technologies in. And we had a group of seniors put on a virtual reality headset for the first time and we put them under the sea in a roller coaster. Some people were literally rocking in their chair, screaming out loud, feeling like they were in a roller coaster situation when in fact they're just wearing a headset. And it, it's crazy how it tricks your senses. That's the virtual reality experience. And whether you're familiar with this or not, just as, as people out there in the world, you know who's doing this a lot? people that are into video games, they're, they're literally going into a different world and then they're going to this different world with their friends. Because if you've got enough money to buy one of these expensive setups so that you have it at home and your friends got one too, and now the two of you get into some virtual reality world where you're shooting bow and arrows at people from the top of a castle as they come at your drawbridge that you're protecting, like it's, it's wild. It's absolutely wild to think about what's normal for certain people who embrace technology as early adopters. Virtual reality technology is very sophisticated at this point. It is normal like those rocket ships I was talking about before. Nobody's really giving it much attention, but if you're in a position to try some like real deal virtual reality stuff, wow. Like it'll really blow your socks off. It's unfortunate that we no longer have the Microsoft stores because they used to let us play with their very expensive stuff. And that was a great experience to, to do that. Speaking of video games, I just wanted to make sure that you know that this is going on. So there's a game called Minecraft and the object of the game is literally mine stones and shape the stone and lay the stone down and build a foundation, a footing for a building. And then you need other materials like marble and you erect a building and it takes you tens of hundreds of hours. This building here, they literally build the interior of the building as well. It's not just the exterior. We could walk into the front door of that building and walk through all of the chambers this is a virtual reality space that many, many people play. Many people, I'm gonna bring that up in a second, but what they're doing here is they're taking texts from the real world and they're transcribing them into books in this digital world and they're being stored in this library and now we can get censored material to people that don't have access to that material and it's making news like big time there's 145 million players every month. And if you were in a place that gave you no press freedom, you would have unlimited freedom if you could access the internet to play this game. 
And it's such a remarkable thing because the internet creates a, a nationless world where regardless of where you are on the planet, you plug in and now you can go into this library and read things that aren't legal in your country. And it's a, a crazy reality. We, we don't even know how to think about that. Who's the government in this world on Minecraft? You know, there's so many large questions we don't know how to even think about. I just like to bring them up so that everybody knows that this is all going on. I think it's very important to have your finger on the pulse of technology. Do you have your finger on the pulse of what you're doing with your technology? Because I stopped using Instagram and I uninstalled it from my phone because I started to look at the part of my smartphone called screen time and I was disgusted by the amount of social media I was consuming in that way. And when I started to realize that an hour or more every day would just go into certain operations on my phone, I started to remove them from my phone to get rid of the bad habit. And it's my opinion that it's a bad habit, you know, but I wanted to change the way that I thought I should. So I got perspective. I looked at screen time. You've got it on your devices. So if you're a smartphone user, if you're an iPad, Samsung Galaxy tab, doesn't really matter. Everybody's providing us the ability to look into our screen time. Just Google how to find that out on your device and you'll figure it out pretty quick. Digital wallets. Let's talk about that. Very touchy subject, even e-transfers. When I speak to certain people, you know, certain people <clears throat> would prefer to not use digital money. And that, that's fine, except when you're not accommodated because you don't use digital money. And, and the people that aren't accepting your physical money or your, your lack of technology in using money, they don't care to do business with you. It's too complicated for them. You know, like, let me give you an example. Can you pay the invoice for your Amazon Prime account with a $20 bill? No. No, you can't. Can you pay Netflix the invoice they give you with a $20 bill? No. And, and they don't care to try and help you figure out how to do it either because they don't want you to be their customer. They just want to talk to the digital money people, the people that are okay with putting in a credit card on a website because that is normal. Very, very normal. Just like transferring money without a check. You know, there was a time when checks were new and that was weird. You know, what, what makes it so that a $20 bill is going to move from my account to your account because I gave you this piece of paper? And now that's what's happening with e-transfers. We're saying, well, I'm just going to push a button on my computer and then it's going to send a $20 bill over to your account from my account. But some people just don't like this idea. But really, the rest of the world, we're, we're all going to keep using online banking and e-transfers. And I, and I just recommend, because it is convenient for you, and it's very fast and it's safe. You can track it. There's digital footprints of all of it. So there, there's nothing to really be worried about in that regards. I, I just embrace it and I use what works for me and gives me value. And I, I just don't know why you wouldn't want to besides you're not willing. That's all because it's convenient, fast and safe. However, you've got to be responsible still and you have to be careful. You've got to check your statements, make sure nothing happened. That's your responsibility. No, nobody else should do that. You know, you've got to look at the statement. You've got to log into the online banking. And it's funny because people are like, ah, but I got to use all this digital stuff. And now I have to go on the internet. This is exactly what I'm saying. You need some digital literacy because that's normal now. And it shouldn't be a barrier when somebody says, here's technology, we're going to use technology and that's going to make it really easy and fast and convenient for us to do. And you're not wanting to do it because it's technology. That to me, my friends, is the problem. You just need to get some more digital literacy so that you don't see technology as an element that you don't like because we only get more technology in the future 
and it only continues to change and all that stuff that we already talked about. And people keep bringing their opinions with them through their experiences. So I just like to poke the bear, you know, that's in my personality to just poke your opinion and be like, hey, well, that's fine. But I guess you don't get to participate in the course now because you don't know how to e-transfer and the people are offering this only virtually and they don't want you to mail them a check that's going to take two weeks to get to them. If it gets there, maybe it gets lost, right? So there's so many ideas. Please consider digital money in a responsible way that's careful. What do I mean by careful? When I talk about technology, I'm always careful. Like when I'm driving a car on the 401 at 120 kilometers an hour, I'm always careful. There's never a time when I'm not being careful because it would be silly to do so. I could have an accident and it could be bad what the result of that accident could be. So I'm doing the same thing with technology. As long as I'm responsible and careful, it's convenient, fast, and safe, and I think it's awesome, but I gotta keep myself doing the right things. Let's talk about social media for just a couple of minutes, just because it's such a huge topic and relevant in our political climate. That's where everybody's going. That's where everybody thinks they get information from. They're jumping on Twitter, they're jumping on Facebook, and they're getting, I'm putting air quotes up everybody because they're getting information off of social media. And what we need to just keep perspective on is what is social media? And if you look at this definition that comes from Wikipedia, now this is a mainstream website. If you know what Wikipedia is, it's a, a human generated encyclopedia, which means we, we could all contribute to it. If you know something about a rare bird and no one's ever written an article about it and you're the first to do so and you submit it to Wikipedia, it just sits up there like it's information. And then you have to wait for somebody to say, that it's not valid. They do a good job of like vetting it on the surface, but then it gets up there and maybe there's something that's not true in there and you just have to wait until somebody identifies that and it gets pulled out. So I don't say that Wikipedia has all of the answers. I'm just letting you know where, where I got this definition. It's a pretty good place to get a, a good idea of what's going on. So they define it as interactive computer-mediated computer technologies that facilitate the creation or sharing of information. Just think about that. It facilitates the creation of information. It facilitates the creation or sharing of information, but facilitating the creation of information, ideas. It, it started there. It's not information. Somebody's opinion is what you're reading somebody's creation and they put it out there they've they're sharing their created information and then you're going to end up seeing some of it but, but you have to know that it, it's not true when it pops up on twitter it's not true when it pops up on instagram it's it's just not so now when when you're on all of these things what you're doing is you're building a user profile. So I'm gonna use Facebook as an example. I'm gonna jump on Facebook, I sign up, and then all the stuff that I do on Facebook, and then a lot of the stuff that I do outside of Facebook on my computer when I'm on the internet is considered when my profile is being built. So the Google searches that I do start to reflect the advertising that I see on my Facebook page because Facebook has call it optics on all the things that you searched for on Google, which is a, a complicated conversation to have. We can't have that all the way here in an in a appropriate way, so we're not going to try. But you just have to think about when you're on social media, you're constantly contributing to a user profile, which is totally normal, which means now when I search something on Google, or when I read articles, or when I watch videos, or when I'm connecting with particular people, even from particular organizations, or if I'm liking a particular post, maybe it's about mountain biking, maybe it's about the mountains and, and, and hiking and stuff like that. All of that starts to be big data in your user profile. 
So now big tech companies, what they do is they build user profiles full of all of our big data. And big data is a powerful thing. It's why Google doesn't ask us all for money because they don't need our money. They just have big data. And with our big data, they can sell the appropriate advertising that they need to to the users that are using their Google service. So think about it this way. Google knows what you're doing. Facebook knows what you're doing as a user. And then they show you ads because they think you might buy that product due to the stuff that they know about your big data. That's about as simple as I can put it for you folks. I hope that was clear. What I want to make more clear is this point. Social media platforms are designed to show you more of what they think you want. Don't, don't believe what you see is the only information that's out there. It's what social media thought you wanted because of what it thinks you like. So when I'm on Instagram and I'm looking at mountain photographs, I keep doing that and then it continues to give me other things related. Maybe it's camping, maybe it's canoeing, maybe it's horseback riding, but it's making assumptions and it's trying to keep all of the topics in this area of interest that it thinks I might like which kind of makes the tools addicting because if I'm liking what it's suggesting to me, then I continue to consume it because I like it, right? It's like eating delicious chocolate cookies. It was, it was just so good. And they put 12 of them in front of me and nobody cares if I eat them all. So the more addicting it is, the more I'm like wanting to do it. And I don't, I don't necessarily even have control over it because I just like to eat these delicious cookies and I'm, and I'm not going to be in a position to have them anymore, except we can plug into these social media outlets every day and every day it keeps giving you what it thinks you want and you keep liking it. And then you lean in the direction of the content and now you're not being well informed by your social media as well. So please don't think that that's what its job is. Because let's just use politics as an example. If, if I continuously like conservative, 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 and I'm consuming a lot of pro-conservative stuff, then what social media does is it says, well, let's show them more pro-conservative stuff and also anti anything else because if he's so into conservative government then he's probably anti-liberal government so let's give him the anti-liberal stuff and more pro-conservative and you can see how this is not designed to keep you well informed it is definitely not it is designed to keep showing you more of what it thinks you want so don't think that you're going to show up on social media and get a good idea or Google news feed or the Apple news feed because it's generating news that it thinks you would lean towards because you'd be interested in it. And it's not trying to keep you well informed. You have to do your due diligence to do that yourself. Okay. So, so please keep that in the back of your mind as you consume information online. And as we continue to consume information online, consider this idea that George Carlin put on the table many, many years ago, whether you like the guy or not, he was a comedian and he had some very, very blunt things to say. And one of them that I like a lot is don't just teach your children to read, teach them to question what they read. And we're in a society now where just because you saw something in a video does not at all mean that that was a real thing. And you can see there's universities out there that are, that are putting in their own effort to see if they can make fake videos of the ex-president uh, trick people. They, they want it to look so real that you don't even know it's not him saying those words and they did it with flying colors. And now you know what's scary is that's normal. And now this is a sample of a movie it's called The Shining. Maybe you saw it. It's an older horror movie made by Stanley Kubrick. And Jack Nicholson is the primary actor in the movie. 
And instead of that, they've injected Jim Carrey into the movie. You can go to YouTube, look it up yourself. It's called a deep fake. That's the buzzword. That's the terminology I want to leave you with. It's called a deep fake. And they just injected his face in and it looks like he was in the movie. But Jim Carrey, the comedian, didn't have anything to do with any of this. None of it. They can just do this now with technology, with artificial intelligence, and you can't stop it. It's, it's going like gangbusters, this, the old saying goes, yeah? So we have to be well in tune with the idea that, hey, just because you saw a video of somebody doing something doesn't mean that it was them doing it. And they can also do that with voices. So they could make a voice that's not a real person sound like the real person saying something and it can trick people. And that's technology today. That's just what I'm making sure everybody identifies as what's part of the landscape. We're at a point with a technology called deep fake where now we'll, we'll start to pay attention to news and information in a different way in the, in the near future and moving forward. I wanted to bring your attention before we wrap up to podcasting. I think that if you're not with a podcast app on your device, listening to interviews, radio programs, you know, even like history type programming, murder mystery, true crime, like whatever you like, they've got podcasting for it. Go ahead and download Google Podcasts or Spotify or Overcast on the, on the iPhone, but try out some podcasting. Uh, it's uncensored, long format, all of the content, none of it's edited down. So it doesn't sound like radio. It doesn't sound like television. It's like real deal. I, I, I just encourage trying out podcasting if you, if you haven't done so already, but I'll leave it there because uh, I can't get into too much more detail about that. People have these things in their houses now. They're called smart speakers. They're little donut shaped things or little pop can shaped things. And they're always hooked up to your Wi-Fi, and they're always listening unless you flip the mute button. And what it does is it answers your questions. It does the things that you'd asked it to do. So you wanted it to write down that you need to buy eggs. It did that because you asked it to. You asked it what the weather was going to be like on Sunday, and it told you the answer out loud. It can go as far as to be connected to your telephone so that your smartphone will place a call for you. And all you did was bark at the living room and say, hey, call my friend. And it just executed that like it's an, it's, it's an assistant for you. Quite a remarkable technology. Again, not for everybody, uh, but some people think that there's a lot of value in something like this. So I just want to make sure that you know what they're all about. This one here is made by Google. There's another popular one made by Amazon as well. So you can check those out. Are you comfortable with ordering food online? This is super fast becoming uh, like a normal thing for lots of people, especially today, whether, whether we like it or not, it doesn't really matter. This is how restaurants are surviving right now. This is how some people are getting all of their food right now because they're subscribing to services like grocerygateway.com or Instacart where they have people collecting the groceries for them and then bringing it, delivering it to their houses or skip the dishes, Uber Eats, ordering things from restaurants and then having that stuff delivered to your home. And all of this is done using tablets, smartphones, laptops, difficult to do any of this stuff without technology. And again, I say for some people, this is turned into every day, all the time, what they're doing to get their things done. We are rounding home plate. I wanted to let you know there's a couple of ways that perhaps I could help you in the future through tech coaches and our small team. Uh, we have an online newsletter. So if you jump onto our website, it'll ask you if you want to join the newsletter. And we every month we're giving away free webinars about technology. We actually have one next week. It's on the 30th of, uh, of September and it's about Google everything. So I'm going to be talking in depth for an hour about all things Google. So sign up for the newsletter. Uh, you can check our website for information about that sort of stuff as well. If you have a group, an organization, anything like that, and you're looking for Tech Talk webinars, I'm very happy to do that sort of thing as well. 
We're starting virtual courses on digital literacy. We're currently doing a smartphones one that's gonna be launching in October and a Windows 10 based educational program, all facilitated via Zoom. That's gonna be in November. Uh, so space is limited for that. Again, follow up on our website for that. Uh, and then if you need any IT consulting or support as individuals or nonprofit organizations, we're very happy to help in that regards too. But with all of that said, my friends, it was an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. And I'm so very grateful to not only be working uh, with the, the Toronto Council on Aging, but also with all of you new folks, because I haven't done very much work in your neighborhood and I'm very happy to do so. So, so thanks very much. Um, Kathleen, I'll, I'll sort of open the floor to questions if anybody has some for the next few minutes. Absolutely. So if you have any questions, feel free to type it in the chat box. Um, so you just type in, there's like a little box on the bottom of your screen where there's a little icon. There's a bubble that says chat. It'll either be on the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on where your Zoom bar is kind of floating around. Uh, so if you click on the chat bubble and it will say chat, uh, you can just type in your message uh, and you can ask any questions you want. Um, I was going to ask one and it's slipped my mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Is this what happens? Are, are there any questions you have about technology or any, any thoughts on what you heard um, Chris kind of share about the different things that are going through with technology? I know um, augmented reality. So Pokemon Go was like all the craze a few years ago or uh, years ago. It was one of the first, I think, augmented reality games that was released for cell phones. And then I think they've since released a Harry Potter game. I know there's some other ones that are on the go. Oh, Amy, good question. Do you feel there's any technology that would be inaccessible for those unfamiliar with tech? That's a very good question. Yeah, you know, what's interesting about that question is it's tech that I don't know very much about myself that's inaccessible. And that technology, I would say, is like modern video game systems. I, I would say that tablets, phones, laptops, computers, all those devices, they're really geared towards whether we agree with this all the way or not, it's more geared towards being designed for all. But then when you start looking at these entertainment video game systems that are released by PlayStation and Microsoft, uh, even Nintendo, some of it's just so complicated and in depth that it's, it's not very uh, non techy friendly. So I would say that the learning curve for video games, which whether that's relevant or not, I guess it's dependent on the individual. But for me, it's too much for me to learn quite often. So I just don't bother. Uh, whereas I never really feel like that with tablets and phones and computers in that way. And I see there's a question in the Q&A. And so they've asked for tech coaches and Chris, do you only work in the Toronto area or do you provide services and supports across Canada? Virtually, we can be everywhere, anytime really. So right now in, in this setting, we can do anything with anybody that's interested and with a willingness to learn. Uh, when it's service provided, we typically have been sticking with the GTA, but that's not necessarily so all the times because we've done a really big project with Alzheimer's Society across the province, uh, remote locations, Thunder Bay, Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie sort of thing. So we're always open to helping however we can help. Uh, so never hesitate to reach out via email or our website. I'm happy to, to take the conversation wherever you like it to go. And Madeline had a question as well. Uh, any quick remarks about environment and technology? Yes, get out into the environment often without technology. That, that would be my remark. Um, that is definitely something that I think is good practice, time away from technology. I also think that a lot of disposable technology is not good for our environment. Um, that said, we create an awful lot of garbage and it's not sorted out in the best way globally. So we've got a lot of work to do in that regards in terms of recycling gadgets and stuff like that. Uh, and then finally, the human environment. We don't know enough about the effects of technology on humans to, to have much to say about that. You know, uh, we're always introducing new technology and then we're always complaining about the effects that that technology has on humans. 
We've done it with microwaves. We do it with Wi-Fi. And now we're talking about doing it with 5G or, or any kind of cell phone reception. So there's all sorts of conversations to have about technology and environment. Um, but we, we have a lot of work to do in all of those areas, I think, definitely. And then dementia and technology. I see that one up there too, Amy. Uh, dementia and technology, you know, first and foremost, I think that one of the more incredible things that's floating around right there now is this Neuralink technology that I mentioned at the beginning. And I realized that's pie in the sky, but that's where all of that kind of thing starts. And what do I really think is possible? I do think it's possible that you put some sort of a chip into a human that fixes their mind. I think that plays a role in the next hundred years in dementia. It doesn't mean that's happening anytime soon, but I do think that we're gonna try and fix dementia with technology. Uh, in terms of maybe apps or something like that, I, I have worked a bunch with the Reitman Center uh, and Sinai Health, and they have a really great app that they've uh, worked with and advocated for, uh, the, De the Dementia Advisor app. And I've had some great feedback on that and experiences using it. So if nobody's tried it and you're looking for a tool in that realm, then I, I would recommend that one. I'm reading this question here. Yeah, so what technology can I use to help me age in place with the environment and long-term care and congregate living? My preference would be to stay home and independent as long as possible. Agreed. I, I always want to be at home uh, and technology allows us to be there. If, if you want to be a high-tech person, then you're going to want a smartphone and you're probably gonna to wanna to have a laptop computer as well. The smartphone keeps you connected and it's with you all the time, which means when you're out and about in the day, which is part of aging in place and being independent, you're fully connected to the world around you that you wanna be connected to from a variety of different apps, which could even include GPS tracking if that's the kind of thing you are interested in. So I think there's an absolute ton of value in smartphone technology for people that are living independently. Uh, additionally, having large screens to look at at home is a good idea. So I also recommend, you know, if, if you can have a laptop computer with a nice big screen, that would be a plus as well, because your computing experience is only as good as you actually experience. And if you're looking at tiny screens all the time, that doesn't seem like a good experience for long periods of time. So you're probably not going to want to do it. Uh, so I, I recommend having a couple of pieces of technology, smartphone, and then have yourself a laptop. Laptop, not desktop, because you can take a laptop somewhere and have somebody help you with it, whereas it's tricky to do that with a desktop computer. There is a comment here about cookies. What is a cookie? a little piece of information that's stored on your computer. Why do you need to know about cookies? Because websites that you visit are capable of accessing the cookies on your computer. And now that means the website's learning a little bit about you. So that's why somebody might wanna clear their cookies. Because now when you go to Facebook, when Facebook's loaded in your internet browser and it refers to your cookies, it doesn't have anything to refer to. So in a way you're minimizing your big data. When I go to, let's say Forbes.com, cause I want to read a magazine and it says, Hey, we want you to accept our cookie. Do you click accept? Then what you're accepting is nothing big. You're not, it's not a big deal. What you're saying is sure go ahead and put a tiny little piece of data on my device that says Chris went to Forbes.com and was looking at this article that was about this. And now when I go to Facebook, Facebook looks at my cookies and they have that intelligence. Now they can be like, Oh, well, Chris is a reader of Forbes and he reads articles that are about this. So that's what cookies are all about. Websites want to dash stash them on your device so that other websites can refer to that data and the original website can also load that much faster the next time you show up because it's got temporary files stored on your computer in a sense. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. 
Are there any more questions? Feel free to type them in the chat or you can unmute, uh, raise your hand if you want to raise your hand and I can unmute you so you can ask the question. I'm noticing a, I'm noticing a picture here or a, a chat message, I apologize, that's talking about the screen time function on the smartphone. And my recommendation would be just go to Google and search for screen time and then the type of smartphone that you have. That's my most direct answer for you because there's so many different smartphones. So are you on a Samsung smartphone? Are you on an iPhone? It doesn't really matter. Just pull up Google and say screen time iPhone and then look for what it says on how you access it. It's gonna be something in a menu, uh, probably in your settings that you'll have to turn on. On, on my iPhone, it was a widget. Uh, it's a setting on my Android phone. So it's gonna be a little bit different depending on the device. Just Google it. If I can recommend anything, master your ability to Google stuff because I Google things every single day when people ask me questions on how to do this and how to do that. How do I figure it out? I just Google it and I read and then I try the thing and I see if I can get it to go. So you should really get comfortable with that idea. That is a very normal skill that we should all really become masterful of, Googling. Wonderful. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat or any hands raised and it is two o'clock. So thank you so much, Chris, on behalf of the Toronto Council on Aging and everyone here. Um, this has been a really informative session. We're very excited that you were able to join us. Oh, I do see one more question in the chat box. Oh, recording. Yes, we're still recording. Um, so I'm still in the process. We are new to um, having video and having um, the ability to record webinars. So I'm working with our communications committee uh, to arrange a Toronto Council on Aging YouTube channel and to post them um, on the YouTube. So yes, I will be able to share the video uh, once we get our, um, our YouTube channel up and running. The other option is I will type in the Toronto Council on Aging email um, and you can email us to, and I can try to file share uh, a copy of the recording for you as well that way. Um, again, thank you so much. I will type uh, that email in before we stop. And yes, I will send out an email uh, to everyone who attended the session. I have, if you registered through Eventbrite, I have your emails and I have the capacity to send out an email for you afterwards to let you know uh, when all the videos are posted on our YouTube channel. Thanks very much, Kathleen.